Hello and welcome back to CIS 126. Once again, I'm your instructor, Victor Campos. So we are continuing our adventure theme project here, the final project of the semester. The summer semester is coming to a close very quickly. If you're looking at the calendar, today's the 26th. The official, the official end of the class is next Thursday, which of course is way too soon. So the final day for the for this assignment, the final project, which I did give on Monday, the requirements of the final assignment have been there since Monday. So if you haven't looked at it on Canvas, it is there on Canvas. The final deadline will be the 6th. And after that, I cannot take any late work at all. Even if you turn in something Pixar worthy, I can't accept it. I've got a deadline myself and I don't have flexibility in my deadlines. I've had flexibility the whole semester in deadlines, but then now at the end here, there's the final deadline. And to remind you also not to scare you and such, if you haven't turned in your animation yet, you're falling behind. If you are waiting until the 30th to turn it in and put the final polish, you're falling behind. Because then are you going to have enough time to then do the game? We're still, still learning the coding this today on Wednesday, and then on Monday the 31st, and then on Wednesday the 2nd. We still have two lectures there, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't already be working on the game. All that I've been doing so far, if you can complete the version that I've completed, you're on track. If you haven't started anything of the game, you're behind. And I know I've been very um, forgiving throughout the whole semester, but now at the very end, I have to stop being forgiving. You're falling behind if you haven't turned in the animation yet. If you're waiting for that month, for that Sunday, you are falling behind. Now I am seeing here as for who's turned in what. Sorry, I haven't turned, haven't graded the other assignment. I'm getting to it, but um, I've I only see five submissions for the for the animation project yet. That's not good enough. Uh, the other half of you need to turn it in now uh, by the end of today, ideally, so you can start to work on the game. Yes, the deadline is that Sunday, but you're falling behind. All right, so let's keep going so you fall further behind. <laughs> uh, let's look at the project here. So I've already set myself up here just to save time. I already have the Adobe Air D SDK running. I already loaded up my project, created the certificate, already published it to my device. Go back to the re previous recording, see so how to do that. I'm not gonna re repeat everything on that. So the game is ready to go. And I'm doing the debug onto my device. So this is the game is going to be running here on my device. Remember to debug the game, not just control test it, but now you want to start to debug it. So you see your trace messages. So you see your feedback of the um, or interactivity. So I'm going to load it up here. The first thing that I see at the bottom, I'm at the title screen, perfect. I click on help, it takes me to the help screen. Trace message says I'm at help. Okay, press back. I go back to the title screen, press start. I'm on the main screen and then I press the door and it animates swings open and I'm at the front door. This is, this is where we left off last time. So we'll forget to end the debugging. This is a little different also. You start to debug, then you have to end debugging. Alt F12, so you can keep working on it. And so what I need to do here now is I'm on the front door. Now, our interaction has been pretty straightforward so far. Let's make it a little bit more complex. We're gonna have three things on the screen that you can interact with. Two things will be a dead end, and one thing will be the right way. So two things will be tappable things, that don't really do anything. They look like they're, they're interactive, but they won't actually do anything. They're, they're a dead end. The third thing will be the interactive thing and more interesting than before, we're going to have one element interact with another element. We're gonna pick up a rock and smash that window to get into the building. So the front door is not gonna work. We're also gonna have it that maybe, hey, what if I, what if I climb the tree? The tree's not gonna work but the, the window will work. And the window will work by picking up a rock and smashing the window. So this of course will give you the idea to be able to interact with 
anything where, okay, the key is placed into the door or that torch is placed onto that pedestal. So it's hit detection, basically. So first we'll do the non-working ones and then the working one. And with the non-working ones, I'm also gonna animate those elements. Uh, tapping them to give feedback that something seems to be happening, but not really. And this of course can be set up in many ways to look interesting or um, obvious or not. So anything that's interactive should be its own symbol and its own layer. So within what I was drawing here so far, everything's in the background. So I need to take a moment to separate things up a little bit. This front door, I'm going to select it. The select tool here, lasso tool. Oops, I was on the wrong layer and it was locked. Okay, so always pay attention to what layer you're working on. To select. Okay, so I got that F8, turn it into a symbol. Call this. Print. All this front. It's on my front door scene. I'll call this main door. Because I had over here a main door, but that was on the gate. So if I call that gate, that'd be better. But I'm naming it here that it's the front door scene. Next up, the tree will also be interactive. So I need to select that to put it onto, to make it a symbol, then put it on its own layer. Selecting it, F8 front tree, this window. This window is front window. Three things will be interactive. They're all symbols. I'm also going to move them to their own layer and shift Click them all with the selection tool. I'm going to cut them, control X to cut, make a new layer, lock the background layer. I can call the new layer elements or buttons or whatever. Then I'm going to right click and paste in place. Now control C and control V is the classic copy and paste. But here with a graphic software, there's two pastes, paste in center, paste in place. Sometimes I need to put something exactly in the center of the screen, so paste in center is perfect, control V. Usually it's not. Actually, that, can, that paste in center, usually you don't do it very much, so I'm surprised that that is the basic control V. Actually, control shift V is usually what you want to do. You're cutting something and putting it in the exact same place, pixel, pixel perfect. So if I paste in, if I just do a regular paste in center, it goes there and obviously then I have to move it into place and then it'll be off by seven pixels and I'll hate that. So instead, control shift V or paste in place. So now it goes back exactly the same to the user, to the game player, it looks perfect. But then to us, the um, programmer, the developer, we know that it's separated. In the library, in the library or on the screen, I can double click it to start to edit it a little bit. I'm just going to, to make it easy for me. I'm going to fill in some color to show that this is an interactive thing. This is optional, but the thing about interactivity and tapping and such, tap will only work on something that exists. This window, for example, it, the, the glass doesn't exist. I didn't color it in. So if I'm someone's trying to tap and they tap the corner here of the window, okay, yes, it's a hit spot, so it's interactive. But then if they hit, if they touch the tap the finger right there where there's nothing there, 
it won't register a hit. There's nothing to tap on. I see it as a window with four panes of glass, but animate doesn't. The code doesn't. So simply filling it in with color, now it is something to click on. Obviously, I would fill it in with color of, of a real window or glass or transparency or a shine or something. But the point is, if, it, if there isn't any color there, it's basically not clickable. Lastly, the tree. Put in all of this too. If somehow they, they tapped in between here where there's no, where there's nothing in the tree trunk, then that would be a miss. There's nothing there to click on, so it wouldn't actually work. Now, because it's a symbol, I can further keep refining it. Drawing it. it wasn't perfect the first time, but it's a symbol, so I can keep going back to make edits. So three things are interactive. These three things need an instance name. So these all need an instance name and I'm going to select each one. You go up to properties, give it some name. Everything we've worked on previously, we've had to give it some sort of name so that then we have a listener. We just keep doing that over and over. That's the good thing. If you kind of understand how this works, you can do it over and over. I'm, of course, going to introduce things little by little, but the big idea that we do over and over is something is going to be clickable. So on the front door here. So this will be front door. Or MC, it's a movie clip or a button. Actually, we'll keep it with buttons. This can be named anything. Then this tree, so front tree, and, and front window BTM. So now each of them have an instance name. Each one is a symbol. Each one is an instance name. They're all on their own layer. So now it's time to make them do stuff. So what I want, when you tap on the front door, it's just going to kind of shake. Like I'm trying to open the door. It's just rattling in there. It's not opening. A little bit later when we talk about music, I'm also going to play, have it play a sound. It's going to have a sound of a rattling door. So for a game where you're dealing with interactive elements, even those that are a dead end, they should give some feedback. Everything should give feedback because your game players don't know anything unless you tell them something, show them something, or if they figure it out. Don't make it too difficult for them to figure it out. So. I'm going to have this door wiggle a little and rattle and play a sound of a creaking door. The tree in a moment, it's also going to shake. Um, maybe leaves are going to fall off, that sort of thing. So two things that are interactive, but they don't actually do anything, but I want them to, to animate. So I'm going to edit the door on its own symbol. I'm going to make some animation here. So F scene or frame five, F6, and moving forward from this, I'm gonna do some animation. And it's just gonna be very totally simple, wiggle it around, move it a few pixels, maybe shake it a little bit. So let's say, okay, F6, jump over here. I'm going to get my free transform and kind of shake it this way, jump two frames over, F6, rotate it this way. Jump two more frames, F6. Put it back in place. Now here's a trick. I'm trying to put it back in place exactly as it previously was, as in frame five. So I need a frame here, but I'm not never going to be able to perfectly put it back into place. So instead, okay, just delete that. And I'm copying 
what is on my previous frame, copying, pasting in place again, paste in center is worthless, usually paste in place. So I've copied the unmoved version over to frame uh, 11. In between, the door's got a little bit of that wiggle. Yes, there's gonna be the part there that it's no longer connected to the background. That's my fault for not drawing it all properly. That's the icing on the cake that I've got to fix up. I can get to that later. So this goes back in place because what I wanted to do then, I then also wanted to, to look like it kind of bulged out a little bit. F6, shrink down a little bit. So we have some wiggle, some bulge, that. If I loop this, something like that. I'm trying to get into it. I'm pu pulling the door, doorknob. So, okay, a little bit of movement and the like. Obviously, when I get to this scene, as soon as I... As soon as I get into this scene of the front door, what happens automatically is it will start to wiggle all on its own, which I, I don't want. In my case, I want to interact with it and then it'll wiggle. So of course, in the timeline of this symbol, I need to set up my code here. Shins layer, frame one, stop. So now the, the scene loads up and the door is not going to wiggle until I interact with it. So code is very powerful. I don't want that to uh, do anything until I tap it. So some amount of animation on some interactive object. So now I've got to interact with it. So code, be careful what you're doing all of this. I'm no longer in the symbol of the main door. I'm back on the front door. I'm back on the main scene. So be very careful what scenes that you are on. You'll lose track of things easily. You could probably be able to fix things with a cut and paste. Cut your code out of the wrong place. Paste it into the right place. Just be careful where you're at. I'm back on the actual scene. I must have the code here where I'm at the front door. As before, I'm gonna do the object.eventListener tap comma run code. Um, I've done it several times so far. So I'm gonna do a little copy and paste. I know it's gonna be an object, event listener, touch tap, something. Define that something and then the rest. So it's basically all of this code from a previous scene that I can paste in, which I'll need to change. I'm not interacting with the main gate anymore. What did I call this one? It's the front door. So it's my front door, whatever was the instance name on the screen, now has an event listener, now is interactive, waiting for interaction technically. What type of interaction? A tap. What happens after we interact? Play some code some code. What's the definition of that code? It's right here. I'm going to say a quick message that this code is running and then something will play. So Fn, all this uh, front door wiggle. Such code built into at action script called front door wiggle, but I'm inventing it now. So FN function front door wiggle. So now I need to define what is front door wiggle. Right here, front door wiggle. Trace me a message in the console output there. Front door wiggle is running. I want the front door to wiggle. 
it's waiting to, to start to play. So front door button play. So what that does is front door is now interactive. It's paused as soon as I get to the scene. But now it's interactive with that ad event listener. And when I tap it, all that it's doing, it's playing its animation, which is currently stopped. The animation is just a wiggle. It's going to get to the end of its timeline. It's going to then go back to the um, stop mode. So press play. My output there says I'm at main, so I'm at the front door. I tap the front door. It opens up. I'm at the front of the house. I tap it. It might not be too visible on my camera. Front door is wiggling. And down on the code, it says, yeah, you're playing the, the wiggle code. Now, we haven't gotten to it yet, but we'll also add some sound so that when I tap it, it's also making the sound of a rattling door. But for the moment, it's doing what I want. Something's interactive, but it's a dead end. There's one more thing that I want to be a dead end. The 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 tree i want the tree let me get it closer to the you know what actually i'm going to make it bigger and get it closer to the house maybe something like that so maybe someone will think oh if i uh get on the tree maybe then i can get on the roof Clean this up just a little bit. This is the icing on the cake stuff that, like I said, don't worry about it. But I'm here already and I can do it quickly. So that tree, I'm going to interact with it. And what's going to happen is the tree is going to fall over. So this is going to be a very different, um, a very different animation here or a very different interaction that I'm trying to interact with something, but then it stops, it, it falls over. Right, so I need a little animation on that symbol. Frame five, start the animation from here, jump two frames over F6. So let's see, falling over. Um, I probably should redraw it rather than simply rotating it and stuff like that. That'll take a little longer. So um, I could also do a sort of rotate onto it falls down, kind of, I guess. There's so many ways to do this. I guess the way I'll do this is I will do it um, maybe frame by frame, not too many frames. Let's say from here, fall. it'll rotate a little bit to the right. Like this. And then after that, F6. The lasso tool. Select a part of the drawing. Transform. Rotate from there. Jump two more. F6. Rotate from there. This is where I might separate it into their own layers. Because I have to make the selection again. Transform is my shortcut. Fully like that. Sure. It's good enough. So it'll be there and it'll follow. Yeah, that'll work. Maybe in between also. Say here, we'll have a splinter of the wood fly out. Put a little piece of wood there that flew out, something like that, I guess. Pieces. This is the part again, this is the icing on the cake that I shouldn't go too far into. 
if you do it quickly, then maybe it's okay, but probably don't spend too much time on this detail just because the, um, the more important part. More frames will make it more smooth, but that's enough. So tree is going to fall over. You interact with the tree, it's going to break and fall over. You're stronger than you think. Well, obviously, I don't want animation to happen here until I tap. So I need some code. Frame one, stop. But after the animation plays, it's going to loop back and the tree's going to be upright again. So I should stop it at this point here where it um, where it falls over. Because again, computers are dumb. They do exactly what you tell them or what you don't tell them. And unless you tell it that stop breaking the tree, it will continue to break the tree. So this is where I need code on frame 11. So I need F7, a blank keyframe. On frame one, stop so that the tree doesn't break. Code will make it break, which is an animation. Then I want the animation to stop right here. I need a, I need a blank keyframe for code. F9, stop. going to fall over and stop at that point. So I've set up the animation of this interactive dead end. So now I need to set up the code for it to do its thing. It's 99% the same as that door. So back to my code. And I actually add a couple comments here. Make the door interactive, but a dead end. Over here, make the tree interactive. Dead end stops being interactive. The door is interactive over and over. You can wiggle that door forever. Uh, of course, you can further program it to after a certain amount of times, the door opens up and a monster comes out. Of course, you can do anything in code. We're not going to do that. At that point, we have it in another part of the game. Here, what's going to happen is you interact with the door, and it's not that it's going to break and come back so you can break it over and over and over. It's going to break and fall over and stop being interactive. We've set ourselves up that this door is interactive. Well, at a certain point, we want it to stop being interactive. We have add event listener. We have remove event listener. Stop paying attention to something. Technically, all the code so far, even we're on, even if we're 20 scenes later, the code is still kind of hanging around in memory where our very first scene stuff is still interactive. After a certain point, I want this, um, I want this door to stop being, in, uh, I want the tree to stop being interactive. So a little bit more fancy, more advanced. But first, I'm going to copy, oops, change that. That's uh, F and front door wiggle. It's a comment, so it won't cause any errors, but that should all match up. And I need all of this code here. Basically, it's the same thing, but it's no longer the front door I'm interacting with. It's front tree. Isn't that what I called it? I forget what I call my things so quickly. Yeah, front tree button front tree button front tree wiggle front tree break whatever you want to call these things front tree break that needs to match this front tree break which needs to match this which needs to match this Play the timeline of the door. Nothing happens. Play the timeline of the tree.
breaks stops. So now the button of the tree should play. So we get past its built-in stop. Something's interactive. This is making it interactive. Interactive with a touch, play some code. The definition of that code is right here. Little message for myself in the output to see if it's all working. The main part that needs to happen is the tree needs to animate. It's been waiting on frame one. Now let it go to frame two and forward. It's gonna to get to frame 11. It's gonna detect its stop. It's gonna stop at that point. See that result. I then need to further program it stopping to be to continue to be interactive. And I need to add that in the symbol itself. Play its breaking animation. It finished breaking, stop the animation and stop paying attention to it to be interactive. So see on my webcam here, I'm gonna do it backwards. So we've got to stop, press the gate. Press the, the front door just to see if it still works. You should always check your stuff just to see that it continues to work. See there, it's wiggling. All right, the tree, here we go with the tree. Tap the tree, whoops, falls over, fun. If I tap the tree again though, it went back to normal. Tap the tree, it falls over, back to normal. That's not quite right. Right, I want it to fall over and no longer be interactive. Computers are dumb. The tree is not going to automatically fix itself unless I program it. So it plays the timeline, it breaks, it stops. Note, add remove event listener in the symbol. Might be able to actually add it here, maybe, maybe in the symbol. I'll do it in the symbol first, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, then it should go here. So again, I don't have spoiler alert. I am the teacher, but I don't have everything memorized, and it's okay because you can always look it up. Uh, but so, in the symbol of the tree. So if I'm looking at only the code here, stop the tree from breaking, frame 11, after it breaks, stop animation, and stop paying attention to clickability, capability. That is the opposite here where we've got the tree is interactive. If we have add event listener, we have its opposite, remove event listener. This is how you program something to stop being interactive. It's still the same name of the symbol. Instead of adding, we are removing, remove event listener. The rest is the same. Uh, no longer let it be tappable, no longer play the function. Check something really fast here. Again, as I said, so even if it doesn't work at this point, after I test it, we'll confirm it. So debug the movie. Here, uh, front tree button. Okay, so it has to be done on the other part, not here. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so this is the right code, but in the wrong place. So not in the symbol. Not in the symbol, but back on the main timeline. So ignore this that I said here, add it in the symbol. Here. So we play, we play the 
Actually, why am I guessing? I have an example over here. One moment. One moment. This route may painting fall this route. Okay, that's the right way. There we go. See that? I don't you don't need to have everything memorized, you just need to look it up. So it is similar to what I was doing, but we needed to specify the root of things. So yes, it is in the symbol. Yes, I was right about that. But it needed slightly different code. Here's the right code. So then remove the listener from the main timeline. All right, so movie clip, this route, we're basically saying from the main timeline, there is the tree symbol. What do they call it? Front tree, BTN. Front tree BTN. So we're saying remove the listener from the tree to no longer have it be interactive. A moment ago, it gave an error because it said, I cannot find the tree. Well, yes, obviously, there is no tree in the tree. We're in the tree itself. So the timeline of the tree. So there is nothing on this timeline that has an instance name of front tree. That's why it gave the error a moment ago. So we then need to say, okay, go back to the main timeline. Go back to the main timeline. And on the main timeline, you will find a tree. Now let's remove its listener. It is no longer tappable. On the main timeline, we no longer have the no longer have the code to make it tappable, which was this front tree break. So within the main timeline dot etc. It doesn't fit all on my screen here. Sorry, but let me try to scroll through it. Remove the listener from the main timeline. So this is representing the main timeline. In the main timeline, you have the object that is interactive. Let's remove interactivity. Let's remove the tap interactivity. Let's remove the ability to play the break animation from the main timeline. So slightly different than all of the code we've been doing before. But this is how you do the remove something from interactivity. I've collected the seven coins, right? I don't want to collect that coin anymore. So stop making that thing interactive. This is the code to make something no longer interactive. The big idea is remove the listener. The details are from where? Usually the main timeline. All right, so I'll run that. And actually, let me stop that. I want to... When it works, if it, if it has an error, it'll tell you. If it doesn't have an error, it won't tell you. So here's where maybe, uh, tell me. Here's where you can toss in a trace. But if we, if we see this message, we know it worked. Stop the tree interaction, interactivity. That is a trace, that is a comment. It's not gonna actually, be important for the game to work, but it's a message for me in my code that if I see that message, most likely the code ran and worked because the system will tell you when you did it wrong, but it won't tell you when you did it right. So we tell ourselves with a trace message. Games loaded up here. So I start the game. Go to the door. I'm at the I'm at the main door. The front door is still 
a, a dead end. It's just interactive, but nothing happens. Now the tree, tap the tree, falls over, tap it again, no longer interactive. And down at the bottom, uh, we're hitting the, uh, uh, to say it's, we got there. So there's that there, two elements. So what I'm showing here is making elements that are interactive on a scene that are dead ends. How to turn off interactivity out of an element because this door is gonna wiggle forever. That's fine, I want it that way to give people, a, to make them think that, oh, maybe I can do something with the door. I want that interactive. But the tree, I only want it interactive one time. So you saw there the importance of remove listener. Next up, now more interactivity and complexity. Now we want to, to get in via the window. The window be interactive via, via everyone's universal key, a rock. So we're gonna take that rock, smash the window to get in. Now, this is going to introduce a new thing of hit detection, but it's still going to use the idea of movement like we did with the gate. Back on the gate scene, we went to the next scene by tapping on the gate, and then the timeline of the gate played, and then when it reached its code, it took us to the front door. That's going to be very similar for the window it's gonna have an animation of it breaking, and then it's gonna take us to the next scene, which will be the first room of the mansion. So there's gonna be animation here of, a door, of, a, of the window breaking. So thinking ahead about something we've already done, we're gonna have a stop code on the window so it doesn't automatically break. We're gonna have animation of it breaking, it's gonna to trigger to a certain point so that the animation doesn't loop. There's gonna be a stop. And then there, there's going to be, go to the next scene in the timeline of the window. The big difference will be now hit detection. I'm gonna draw a rock and the rock will be movable. Tap and hold to move it. And then when it detects that the rock object has touched the window object, play the animation of the window, the animation will play, it will hit its go-to code and then go to the next scene. Well, now knowing this hit detection, well, what if someone tried to use the, do use the rock on the door or the rock on the tree? You're gonna need two symbols, one that you're picking up and one that you're touching it with. So we have three symbols so far there, we're gonna make a fourth one. And that rock then now is gonna be programmed to interact with the window. You could on your own, program it to then interact with the other things. That's the icing on the cake. Let's do the actual cake. So I need to draw a rock. And sized of the different size of the um, brush and fill it in with some color. I'll figure out the details later. That needs to be a symbol. So I've drawn it, F8, convert it, front rock. Right, I can have it way off, off to the side over here. Have it close to the window. So here in the logic of things, if I have it off to the side over here, people may or may not think that it's interactive. If it's the exact same stroke as the other things, it may just recede as a part of the background and people might not think to interact. If it's a different size stroke, it might give a little bit of a hint, this might be interactive. Um, maybe, if I also angle it or something like it's precariously perched somehow, like it's gonna tip over, I might think that might be interactive. So you see all of these considerations to hint. If I have it, let's say near the window, that might be a further hint, perhaps something happens here. 
Now, what if I have it up on the tree? Well, why is that rock in a tree? That might be important. So there's all of these things to consider because you in your mind know exactly what is interactive here. But when you have other people play your game, they start from zero. They know nothing. They're going to start to play and learn little by little. So I'm going to put it, uh, I'm going to put it way off to the side over here just for fun. That needs an instance name. Everything that is interactive needs an instance name. So we'll call this front rock BTN. It's a button, not really a button. It's a draggable element. I should probably call it something else. Front rock underscore OBJ for object, but whatever. These things can be called anything you want. And what I want is an animation in the window for it to break, the animation to stop, and then to take us to the next scene, there'll be a sound of a crashing window once we get to sound. But then from here, let's see. So in the symbol, start on frame five, F6, moving forward, animate the breaking. Let's see, how do I want to do this? So skip two frames, F6. I think the way I'll do this is we'll have like some shards of... or just like some kind of like sparkles of breaking. And I'm just going to keep this super simple. I'm going to, with the eraser tool, start to erase some of the window. Obviously, if I had the time, I would further further lovingly animate every frame. But general some amount of frames here some on the floor. And I could work on that painstakingly later. Need some animation that, oh, I broke into it. And maybe the maybe because I'm looking into the house, it's also dark in there. And it'll really sell it once we add the music. So I want that to be paused for some amount of time. Don't forget your timelines and such, uh, your timings, I mean. In my mind, of course, it broke and it's in my mind, I see it and it's broken. Well, when someone actually plays the game and you animate it breaking and then quickly go to the next scene, there's not enough space, there's not enough time to um, have the person realize, oh, okay, I did, I broke, I succeeded, I broke the window. So some amount of pause at the end here. Then I need actions. First, uh, stop the breaking, Just stop. On the frame um, 24, F7 there. After it breaks, after the little pause, then move over to the next scene. Stop after break. To next scene. Let's 
seen hall main or hall one or whatever. So I don't have a scene yet. So this needs a little bit of setup. I don't have a new scene there for yet. So I'm going to add the code, but then the code will take me to someplace that doesn't exist yet, which will probably cause an error. But in, ultimately, I need all of those things. If I don't have them all at that moment, that's okay. But I need to create all those things. I'm going to go to a new scene. I write the code to go there, but that scene doesn't exist yet. But I'm going to write the code and then I'll make the scene. So moving to another scene, I can just copy it from everywhere else that I've done it. Right? It's the. the movie clip go to and play somewhere code. So from the main timeline, go somewhere, frame one of some place. There's no all main yet. I'm telling you to go to a scene that doesn't exist yet. I'll make it in a moment. So I need to have I need to have something that triggers the, the timeline of this symbol. Take us to spot there. And we can also have a trace. So go to all main. I need a new, after the front door, it's the main hall. So we'll call that new, sim, new scene scene, hall main. I'm not going to stress it so far. I'm going to draw that properly in a moment, but I just want the stop at this new scene, which is now at scene hall main. It's a brand new scene. Get the details set up in a moment. But going from here will take us into the main hall. There'll be then a few paths to go through. Um, To get to that next scene. Front door, we need to pick up the rock and make it hit the, the window. Now, just about coming up to our first hour mark here. So we'll take a break actually. This will be a little bit of code to get this to work. Because what we need to do is have object that is interactive, but also movable and within a boundary, and then hit detection. So more complexity here. So we'll take a break and then we'll continue from there. So again, all of this code that I'm writing here, of course, I will upload it to Canvas and the recording is happening. But when we do the break here, I'm going to try to leave up my code on screen for you to look at it. But I won't be able to show everything at once. So here's here's as much as the code that I can show on the front door. Yes, it does fit. Okay, so that's all the code there on the front door so far. It's uh, twelve. Uh, it's one o'clock. We'll uh, take a break until one ten, and then we'll go on. So back at one ten.
All right, everyone, let's go on. So what we need to do is make some interactivity for hit detection. And the way that this will work is you need to make the, um, you need to make the object interactive and also um, need to set boundaries for it in order to be able to move around. Trying to get my oh, it's too big. It's going to be stuck unless I resize my screen. So I think we'll be okay. But what I need to do here is set up so that the um, the rock is interactive. I also need to set up boundaries. So first code here, something brand new that we haven't seen before. Create the boundaries for the object to move. Need to have code here to keep track of, we're gonna move something, but it has to stay within the boundaries of the screen. We don't want it to fly off of the screen and then the game is unwinnable. You can also set this up. So let's say something, uh, oops, I did something here. So you um, could set yourself up that you have boundaries, you're moving something and it's gotta be inside of a space. You could define that space. So set movement boundaries. are to create a variable, we'll call this rock boundaries. So a variable is a container. It keeps track of something, a piece of data. It's a variable, it will vary, it will change. So we're creating boundaries. We can have boundaries for many things. So rock boundaries is fine. Colon rectangle. So we're defining this to be a rectangular shape, which could be a square. A square is a type of a rectangle. So there's going to be x and y coordinates of where this thing could exist. And so what we're going to do is. Create a new rectangle, capital R. Now, this is just the way it's going to be done over and over. It's always going to be var, create a variable. It's going to change here. What is the thing? What are the boundaries of the thing I'm going to move? That part can change. Then it'll be over and over colon rectangle equal to new rectangle. That'll be the same over and over. And then basically here we're defining um, the starting point and the ending point of a rectangle. The top left corner, it's backwards on the webcam, I guess, but the top left corner to the bottom right corner. So if I have it to be zero, zero, Notice it's saying right there, a rectangle starts with X and Y, and then it's width and height. So I'm going to start from the top left corner of my game, zero, zero. And then how much to the, to the width of it is, let's say 100, and then how much to the height. So I'm saying start from the top left corner of the um, stage and then allow movement 100 pixels to the right from the top and 100 pixels down from the top. Now, that's probably wrong because 100 over here and 100 down here, well, I'm only gonna make a, an area that big. The rock will only be movable in that area. That doesn't make sense, of course. I want to be able to move it around specifically here. So if I figure out with my ruler, if I get my ruler out and figure out what is this point right here, let's say it's 500 over 
and 400 down, then my code will represent that. Start from 400 over. 355 down, I'm just picking random numbers. So the top left corner, and then allow it to move over some amount of pixels. I don't know, 120 down, and then down 300. So now I'm creating an area from some point, some area to move around in. That is more complex than we need it. We're gonna say start from anywhere in the top left corner, and then automatically based on the stage dot stage width, and then stage dot stage height. You figured it out. Animate, you give me the correct values. We're gonna say this rock is movable from anywhere on the top left corner to the bottom right corner of the whole screen, no matter the size of the device. Small device, large device, medium device. All of this is to create boundaries from top left to bottom right. Anything beyond that can be done, not required for the assignment. If you wanna get more advanced, icing on the cake. But here I wanna be able to move the rock anywhere, including up on the roof of the, of the building, I guess. So if I wanted to fully define all that, I would, but I'm not going to worry about it. This is what we need here. Zero, zero stage, stage width, stage height. detect picking up the rock and letting go of the rock. So two event listeners. We've had the event listener of a single tap. Well, we now are going to basically a tap and hold and then let go of holding. So two event listeners there. This rock Front rock button. Front rock button dot add event listener. will be a touch event. So basically what I have above, but this time touch begin. And another one, touch end. So this is the code to set yourself up for click and drag. This is the code to set up that something is going to be detecting when we're holding on to the object and something that when we let go of the object. So as we are moving the object, we have to do a few things. Stay within the boundaries, number one. We could do other things like play a sound and whatever. Um, and, or an animation and such. And then after we let it go, it's got to do something else. So comma, similar to above, after some event, comma, do some code. And we'll do this as FN rock move and FN rock stop, FN rock stop. Now, as I'm doing the code and teaching it and so forth, I'm not going every single explanation about why this comma and period and so forth. That'll just take longer uh, to understand everything. You don't need to understand everything, just the main things to get it to work. And so if your code looks similar to mine, it should work. You're seeing my code work. So if you do something similar, yours should work. And so there's a rock, listen for holding on to it. There's a rock, listen to letting go of it. Once we move it, do some code 
Once we let go, do some other code. Time, if that happens as we're holding the rock, then FN rock move. And touch event, colon void, races, function, fn rock stop, event, touch event, colon void, curly braces. So we need to tell it what does it mean when we rock move? What does it mean when we rock stop? So we define it here. That's the same as above. And now we're adding a new layer to it. Break this to the next line because I need to write a few lines in between for readability. I'll make myself a note. This is the end of my FN rock move code. I'm also give myself a trace message. Actually, I might not put the trace message because this is going to be constantly saying, well, I'll put it in for the moment. We'll say rock is moving. Real part, well, the code to actually make it move. Event dot target dot start touch drag parentheses. So this is code basically to move the thing that I touched. And this code is detecting touch the rock. And as long as you begin touching the rock, now let's start to move that rock. So there's built-in code, start, touch, drag. Let's move this thing. All of this is basically saying whatever we, whatever we touch to this rock. That is all saying this rock, let's start to move it. Well, we need to set some code up here, event. A touch point ID. Just the capitalization's got to be very exact. Capital P, capital I, comma, false, lowercase. What does false do again? I think this is about recentering the object. Check that in a moment. And then finally, rock boundaries. Right, so there's a rock. Let's start to move it. Um, I forget exactly what touch point ID means. So again, I don't have everything memorized, but I know this works. False, I believe, is don't recenter the object and then rock boundaries. Stay within the boundaries. So start to move the object and keep it within the boundaries. That, that works first before the rest of the code. There's things that could have gone wrong so far. So let me test this part so far. I'm going to debug that. I do have an error. OK, no problem. Let's see about that. I think I mistyped something. Oh, yeah, there. When I was trying to click on things, I accidentally typed a letter randomly there. So that's why I'm saying it's a good idea to test your code. Did that over on the front window when I was looking for my keyboard. I must have hit the letter on accident and added that. So, no error this time. My game is loaded up. I'm going to do the usual. I have to go to. Start gate. This stuff still works here. Sure, the tree falls over. All right, so now here's the rock. I'm going to tap it and hold it, and it's moving now. See that? So I'm able to move that object around. And my output down there, it says, okay, I broke the tree, stop the tree. Rock is moving. 
So yep, the rock is moving. I see it moving on the screen and such. So cool. Test your code every few bits to make sure it's working. There's boundaries to move around in, got it. There's listen for start to move it, got it. There's listening to stop dr dragging it, got it. To define what it is to move, got myself a little message, start the actual movement, leave it within the boundaries. Done. So now touch end. There's this rock that is going to touch this window. Once the window touches the rock, play the animation of the window, and then um, to the next scene. So, this is happening in rock stop. Break that to the next line. Give yourself a quick comment here. This is the end of rock stop. Paste message. Rock is stopped. We have a start touch. We also, we then need an end. A bit of an end as well. Basically, this bit of code like this, but be careful. Then we have here stop touch right here. Stop moving the rock. Note the difference. I did a copy and paste for to save a little effort. It is still that whole event target, et cetera, et cetera. But now it's stop instead of start. And the rest of the code is not there. That false, the boundaries, those are no longer necessary. But event touch point is. Okay, next, I'll check if there is a hit detection. So here comes new code, conditional statements. On the condition of something, do this, or else there's something else. If the rock touches the window, break it, or else. Don't break it, of course. If the rock touches the window, or sorry, if the rock touches the front door, do something else. So here's how you can make decisions. Here's some basic AI. We're programming it to detect. So we have if parentheses, curly braces, else curly braces. It's basic skeleton. If something is true, do some amount of code, or else that's not true. So do another amount of code, if else. Here we have two possibilities. It can be programmed to detect 10 possibilities. We're not going to get that complex. It's either or. It's either the rock hits the window or not. I'm not at the moment programming. If it hits the tree, that's the icing on the cake. So. This is the basic skeleton for checking something. I'm going to break this into multiple lines for readability. This and a note. And if else for the rock. So it's the same as before. I just broke it into multiple lines to be able to read it. And either trace the rock 
hit the window. Trace the rock did not hit the window. Possibilities here. If the rock did hit the window, then play the animation of the of the window, which is front window button. A. The same as before, where we have a code reliant on a symbol playing. We have the front door animate, break, stop, then play, and then take us to the uh, the hallway. If there was no detection, just say the message. Don't do anything. Well, here's the important part within the parentheses here, we are going to check if this object touched that object. This object is the rock. Front rock button. So if front rock button dot hit test object, There's a JavaScript code, or there's an action strip code that detects if two objects have, have touched, if even one pixel of the corner of the object, if you need to set it up that this has to be exactly center, it's kind of slightly different code, but at the very least here, if some pixel of the rock has hit some pixel of the window, window's got its own name, which is, front window, so some object detecting if it interacts with another object. If that is true, if it's true, that this object interacted with that object, great, play the animation of the window, or else those two objects didn't interact, that'll be false, so we land here. If true or else false. So that should be it. Let me, let me debug that. Errors. I'll load it up. So here's how you can have hit detection. Combining with um, drag and drop, and then hit detection, and then if else conditional statements. So pretty complex. See the result. So here, go there, go there, pick up the rock. So my output is saying. Okay, now at front door, rock is moving, rock is stopped. The rock did not hit the window. Move it over here. Rock is moving, rock is stopped, rock did not hit the window. Now if I move it on to the window, and get it closer and closer, I have to do this backwards. So it happened too fast. Uh, I did it here without you seeing it. But uh, okay, so rock is moving, rock is stopped, rock hit the window. Now at Hall main broke window go to hall main that's interesting that it that it showed the code backwards there but it worked anyway i went to the hall right, here's my hall that's not complete yet um but it worked dragged the object detected that object played the animation and moved me to the hall so working so far Working so far. So now we're in the hall main. So what I want to do here is make two paths 
One is going to be the good ending. One is going to be the bad ending. Um, just going to draw a simple hallway, inner hallway sort of thing. Say there's going to be brought in perspective properly later, but let's say that we've got a uh, move to the right, move to the left. Now, this is just a simple background, but to interact, you have to think a little bit ahead here. So in its own layer, very, very simply to interact, I'm just going to have a simple square. It'll have to be drawn a little bit better later. It's going to be a symbol. That area is clickable. That area is clickable. I can make it transparent, I can draw it, I can do a bunch of things. I just am trying to set up that click somewhere on the right, click somewhere on the left, go to the hallway to the right, go to the hallway on the left. So some form of interactivity here. These need to be symbols. So um, tab, corridors, or what's another word for this? There's hallways, there's corridors, there's something. Tell me in the chat other synonyms, but we'll call these tap doors, I guess. And these each need to be a symbol, F8. This will be hall um, right. This is hall left. Yeah, so hall left, hall right. Say that the right path is going to take you to the bad ending and that the left end is going to take you to the good ending. What's going to further happen on the right, a creature will appear. It'll have hit points. You're going to tap it X amount of times to defeat it. If you can't defeat it within the amount of time, bad ending. Make it hard. It's going to need to be like 90 hit points and the time limit is too short. So it might be doable that they can pass that part, but we're going to make it very hard for them to pass it. And um, that'll that'll be uh, the hard way to go to the right. Most likely you'll, you'll get the bad ending, maybe you'll get the good ending. The left side will be more of the good ending parts. So in order for us to then move, let's see if that, uh, on our scenes, we've got hall main. I'm gonna create a hall right and a hall left. Hall right, and I'll, Better eventually. Stop this is the part where kind of the cool thing about coding is sometimes it's repetitive. If you get something to work properly one time, you should be able to get it to work multiple times. The challenge, of course, is to make the things um, properly the first time. Scene all left. Over here, I don't know, this will be like a fluffy bunny. 
So, um, and I'm stressing too far, but this will be this side, the good side. And uh, that also, as you're seeing here, I'm adding the stops so that it doesn't run away train. I should add the trace messages as well. Trace at left hallway versus trace at right hallway. So from here, they go left, they see that, they go right, they see that. That's gonna be a boss that's gonna, you're gonna have to tap it interactive, get its hit points down and so forth. We'll get to that in a moment. Both of these have a stop, of course. These are separated onto various layers and such. To get to these places, well, interactivity here, nothing too complex here. Um, no need to set it up. Well, I need first the key to open the door and solve the puzzle. Maybe we'll circle back and make that more complex. Here's just two paths to take. So these need instance names. Right, movie clip, or actually button, or left button. These are now interactive. The usual, uh, click a thing to go to a place. So here I'm saving myself this effort. I'm just going back to the title scene where I know I have my code properly working. It's the same thing as we've done several times. So now in the main hall here, Click to go right, hall, bad ending. Hall, good ending. This. This is all coming from. all from previous code. Some copy and paste. So going to the right, we'll run some code to go to the right. The code to define to go to the right is here, the trace message, the move me there. So something very, very similar to move left, copy that. It's got to match, it's got to match, that matches, that matches, that matches. So this is what I'm saying about the programming. Yes, I make it look so easy. Yes, if you also have, you know, 15 or 20 years of teaching and working in this field, and it'll look easy for you too. But in one semester, in one summer, yeah, it can definitely be very complex. That's why you want to come in person, get help and so forth. Uh, that's why you want to get that animation done today if you're still working on the animation uh, and hoping for that Monday, that Sunday deadline, you're falling behind. Okay, so to make this make sense, this right side, Paul BTN right. This is Hall BTN right. to all right, let's say. So that needs to match that. My trace message will say that. My code will say that. More importantly, where are we going? We're going to the next scene. I'm gonna call that scene SC hall right. C hall right. Uh, 
Now, all of this is happening very linearly. You can only go in one direction. Um, to make it go back, you have the knowledge. I may not show it, but you have the knowledge to navigate anywhere you want. It's gonna be basically this code over and over. It's just, what is the name of the object? What is the name of the specific function? Defining the specific function, defining where are we going? So you have the knowledge to make it go anywhere you want. I may not show going forward and back. You should be able to do it with a little bit of thinking one step outside the box, one half step outside the box. So even though if you're a beginner and it seems complicated and such, I'm giving you all of these ingredients that at the very least, if you use these ingredients and take them for the minimum, it should all work. And if you take one step outside the box, you should be able to do extra things. Just like with the animation, I know people want it all the way to the 30th because you have so many ideas. Great, but you don't have so much time. So here with the game, I'm sure your mind is swimming with so many possibilities of further things to do. You're going to run out of time to do those because you have to do at least the minimum that I'm going to show you here. So um, do a quick test. This probably will work, but it's always good to check your code once in a while. Nope, there's an error there. So let's fix that. Uh, oh, yeah, because uh, there's no clickable thing there, so it's confused. What are you trying to click on? There's no such thing as left. Of course not. There's that thing called... There's that thing called um, all left button. So it's going to cause an error. I'm trying to jump ahead because I didn't finish that bit of code, but action script doesn't like that. So I will add it in just so that it doesn't complain. So on this screen, it's just a simple moving, moving left and right. And see. So um, we do start, we go front door, we move the rock onto there, see it broke. We're inside the house. There's the left and the right. Going to the right goes there. There's no way to go back. I didn't program it, but it is doing what I want so far. The output is saying its thing there. Rock is moving. Rock is stopped. Rock has hit the window. Broke window. Go to call main. Uh, those two are out of order, but it doesn't matter. They both worked. Uh, the animation of the of the window happens, broke the window, moved to the hall. The hall, I tapped on the button to go to the hall to the right. It's now running, and now I'm at the right hallway, the hallway at the right. So working so far. This boss needs a little bit of setup. So the way this will work is there will be a um, long hallway far into the hallway there is a door For that, a boss will appear to battle the boss. Basically, you tap it X number of times, and you can't escape until the boss has been defeated. 
So this is taunting you in a way that there is a door at the end of the hallway that I want to go that way. And for a moment, I'm going to see the door. I'm going to try to interact with the door. But then the boss will appear. I have to quickly battle it. And if I don't defeat it in time, the um, game is over. If I do defeat it, then I'm able to go through the door. Good ending. I'm going to be, I'm going to be mean and cheat and make the boss very difficult to defeat. A lot of hit points and not enough time to defeat it. So setting myself up here, there's an interactive element of this door. So that should be its own symbol. Here. Uh, so the going to be its own interactive element. This will be um, all right door. It's an instance name. All right, door BTN. Now this will be interesting because the um, the this stop command we actually don't want it to stop. There's going to be some animation that happens. And so we do need the timeline to play. Everything that's been happening so far has been happening on one frame of everything. But now we're going to have some animation happen as well as the interactivity in the code. So actually, no, stop right here. So you can delete it or comment it out. Don't stop. When we get here, so let's say after about one second, one second to kind of see what's here. After this, we have this mini boss or the main boss or whatever. And um, just to put some amount of time here, we'll probably put more moment, but F7 frame 25 mini boss. So from the previous scene into this scene, a little bit of pause here to kind of get our bearings. Oh, there's a door. I should probably interact. Whoops, the boss appears. So obviously we would want it walking into the scene and animating and all this amazing stuff, but not quite yet. So I'm going to have some some evil character. So um, I'm going to turn that into a symbol. And the um, The boss will appear far away, come at us at a certain point when it's too close. If we didn't defeat it, game over. Uh, there's going to be a time limit in a sense that as it gets closer to us, time's running out. And within the time limit, if I tap it enough, weaken its hit points, it'll die. And then I can hit the door and exit. But I won't be able to interact with the door until the boss is dead. So that needs to be a symbol. This will be um, all right, mini boss. It's 
a symbol, instance name. Should do that right away to not forget. That is a symbol. I'm going to fill in some colors just so that I know that it's interactive. I can finish the details later. Animate it with its mouth gnawing at you and everything later. I need that to be small because of perspective. And I want it to get big. So time limit, just like a quick, I don't know, three seconds. So frame 95 or so. F6, I have this starting on frame 25, going over to 95. At frame 95, I'll make it larger as it got closer to us. Really large to fill up the screen. There's the door. I wish I could have gotten to the door. And in between, well, it's just a simple right-click classic tween. So maybe animating too fast, all of that can be tweaked later, add more time, but there's nothing there for a moment. Maybe I could set it up that it's there all along and then it starts to move. Maybe it walks into view, maybe the door opens, maybe it fades in, there's so many possibilities here. Let's say to maybe keep it simple, I'm going to have it that, um, so I'm going to copy it and paste in place on the first frame like that. So they'll, it'll be there paused for a moment. Oh, I'm in this new room. Cool, what's that? There's something at the end of the room. Oh, it's coming at me. So that's enough that I'll do there for complexity. That's what's happening on screen. Now, code-wise, there's stuff to do, and this will be the last thing for today. And again, if all of this is working for you, you're on track. If you're barely going to start the game now, you have to catch up. Now, I am going to upload my FLA file. One way to catch up is for you to um, borrow my code and add it to your project. That'll work fine. Instead of, instead of writing it manually, you can copy and paste my code. I am putting it there on Canvas. That's a way to help you too, but don't wait until the very end to, to start to work on this. You should be working on the game by now. Get the movie finished. I know you have an amazing vision. You're running out of time. All right, so for the code here, you set up, Set up a few things. Set up a few things. So all of this code F5. So just extend that action script. It starts here and it exists all the way to the end. So it's just F5 all the way to the end. The background starts on that first frame, F5 all the way to the end. And then the character, well, it's visible at one point. It's paused for a while, then F6. Then from here to here, we'll animate. So F6, and then in between, it is classic tween. You can make it move around and dodge around and all of that with a motion tween. That's more complex, don't worry. So with our code, That's what we will set up. Um, keep track of if mini boss is defeated. Not. So we're going to do decision making. We saw a little bit of decision making on the previous scene where we picked up a rock, and if it touched the window, true. 
move us to the next screen. The rock didn't touch the window, false. Do something else. Now, is the boss dead, true or false? So var, let us create a variable. We'll call this uh, hall right boss, HP. HP. Um, live. Is it alive or not? Colon, Boolean, capital B, equal to false. Uh, actually, do it backwards, dead. So is the boss dead, true or false? It's either true, it's either false. The boss is alive or not. It's not half dead, half alive. It is alive or not. If it's still got one hit point, it's still alive. So this is a variable. This is a, we're keeping track in memory. Is the boss dead? True or false? At the beginning, once we get to the hall, of course it's not dead. It just woke up right now. So dead is false. Of course it's alive. The opposite of dead is alive here. So it's alive. Uh, door interaction based on boss dead or not. So we need to make the event listener and such for the door. I can take my previous codes that I've used about there's something to interact with, blah, blah, blah. I can take most of that. Need to change it a little bit. So there's going to be this hole with some code, some code, some trace. This one is somewhere. So this door, what do they call this door? All right door. All right door. Should look very familiar. This will take us to uh, function go to good ending or ending good. Ending good. Not just yet, we'll say function go to ending. It'll determine if it's good or bad in a moment. It's not going to automatically go to the good ending. It has to depend on if you've defeated the boss. So then this should match go to ending. Ending. This is running. Go to the scene in a moment. We'll do that in a moment because it's got to be more complex than that got to make a decision. So I've set myself up for the interactivity, at least that I'm tapping the door. And the um, tapping the door. And I need to detect, check if boss is dead first before going to good ending. So here's that if else something happens, do something, or else do something else. Take it apart. So this is checking. If the boss is dead, then you're free to go through the door. If the boss is not dead, keep fighting the boss. This is a decision happening here. So either um, trace boss is dead, go to good ending. Versus trace is not dead yet. 
fighting. So this code about go to the good ending needs to be inside of the section of boss is dead, go to the good ending, if else, the true and the false. So this movement needs to be in here. If something is true, do this part, or else it's false, do that part. So you see how that is set up there. Going now, it will take us to SC and good. That'll take us to end good if we meet the condition of being true. If this hall boss right dead is true, do this part or else it's false. When we first get into this screen, of course, it's false. It's not dead yet, so it'll automatically hit this part. Not dead yet, keep fighting. Well, what are we checking over here? It is simply hall, just copy and paste here. If what we detect here is true, do this part, or else what we've detected is false, do this part. As soon as we get to the scene, boss is dead is false. This is going to be false. It's going to skip this, jump here. Boss is not dead yet, keep fighting. We need to flip this over. We need this to become, we need this to become true. Or else, game over. We have the time limit. We have this amount of time happening here, coming at us, defeat it. If we don't defeat it in time, when it gets to the end here, it got us, it ate us, it took us to the bad end. So before we set up the good ending, we have to set up this bad ending. The bad ending will automatically happen unless we defeat the boss. So the time limit is that we have these 95 frames to defeat the boss. If we don't defeat it by the time we get to 95, the code will automatically take us to the bad ending. So on frame 95, F7, code here to take us to the bad ending. The bad ending doesn't have anything set up here yet. In my case, it's gonna be a tombstone, with your name on it. So on the bad ending, I've got some sort of screen that shows game over. I'll wait to the right. I'm racing, racing against the clock to get to this point here. Or if it ever does get to frame 95, I automatically go to the bad ending. So on frame 95, F7 there, my code that needs to be there, trace didn't beat the boss in time. It's me to the bad ending. So I just need any example of the move code. There's the move code. Is it going seen and bad? Oh, I'm not finished with the code to defeat the boss. I'll finish that in a moment, but I want to test my code up to this point just to make sure it's right. Because there's these all of these settings about um, there's the boss alive or dead. There's the interactivity with the door. There's stuff there. So 
let's let me just run my code at this point just to make sure there's no errors no errors so far so what 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 i've programmed it so far is if i move to the right the beast will come at me i haven't interact i haven't programmed interaction with the beast yet um but if it gets to me all the way it will kill me and it'll automatically go to the bad ending so let's see play Going to open the going to put the rock. It's hard to do it backwards. Book the window. I'm on the two sides. I'm gonna go to the right. Here we go. So here's the new stuff. I go to the right, tap here, it pauses for a moment, it comes at me. It's gonna get me maybe, and it got me. So I'm on the bad ending. I haven't programmed yet, start over, end the game. That's also still coming. Um, but the time limit ran out. It's way too short of a time limit. Of course we can change that. That is adding more time here. I've only go, it's only going from frame 25 to 95. If I want more time, I need to extend all of this. One way to do this is if you click and drag to select all of those frames, F5, now let me take it up to five seconds. So to give it more time, to slow it down a little bit, I need to F5 all of those frames more time. That might still not be enough, but that's enough for me at the moment. So now I've given it a little bit more time. Okay, so I know it's going to, I know it's going to get me to get the good ending. Further with our code, I need to flip all right boss dead to true. And the way that will happen is by tapping the, um, the boss X number of times so that it gets defeated. So here now we'll keep track of hit points. This is only keeping track of if it's dead or not. Now I want to keep track of, of its actual hit points track of mini boss hit points. If reached if uh, battled get enough flip all right boss dead to troop. So if I then now get true and I try to interact with the door, true will happen here, it'll take me to the good ending. Let me actually put something on the good ending because I'm not. Have anything on good? Um, I don't know. Uh, pot of gold, I guess. Fully looks like a pot of gold, but that's a pot of gold. We got to the end of the castle. <laughs> All right, so then that needs a stop. Tiny, happy sun, good ending, bad ending. So the um, variable that will keep track of the hit points, uh, like any amount of programming, there's many ways to do the same thing. And I can either start with X number of hit points and deplete them down to zero, or start from zero and go up to the maximum hit points. Either way, it's the same result. We're gonna go with, uh, you need to tap it enough times. So zero to X. So we'll start with um, all right boss HP 
which is going to be a number that is set to zero. I haven't hit the box yet. Um, I guess maybe it makes a lot more sense to do it backwards, 99 hit points down. Um, I think we'll be okay here. Uh, let's call this hits. When people talk about hit points, I usually think it's a number that then goes to zero. I want to think about it in terms of I have, how many times have I hit the boss? So we'll just call it how many hits. I have not hit the boss at all yet. The game just started. I just barely got to the right hallway. I have not hit the boss yet. So that's zero. So we need a uh, event listener to listen for when we hit the boss. So needs the usual code here of interactivity the whole event listener thing. I need the function that defines that. So the hit, so the boss is interactive now. It's function mini boss hits. And we'll say uh, trace current hits. Wait, we'll say um, trace this just to make sure that it is correct. We'll say current hits. As soon as it gets to this side of the game, it'll also tell us in the output, we haven't hit the boss any amount. Current hits is um, zero. When we hit the boss one time, one hit to the counter. We started at zero. We hit the boss one time, we, add, we need to add to it. So there, is taking whatever the current value is and just adding one. Of course, we can get complex with what about if we hit it with a staff versus a sword versus a fireball. Of course, we can get all that complexity. It's gonna be a double effective hit. Of course, all of that can be done. For the basic thing we're doing here, it's just every hit is just gonna be one increment, one damage, one hit. So then now we can have it say, It's it starts at zero, and as I hit it once, down on the output, it'll say now it's got one hit. I hit it three more times really quickly, then it'll say now the new hits is four. So it's also telling me down at the bottom how many hits I've done. Well, what I'm trying to do ultimately is another conditional statement, another if else, another decision to make if. I've hit the boss enough times, it's defeated. I then get true, go to the good ending. If I don't hit it in enough times, then I get the bad ending. If you've hit the boss enough to get true. So if something or else something else,
So it's and if else uh, check hits. So either we've got it's the boss enough. Huh? Not hit enough. Keep fighting. And none, of the, none of this is appearing, of course, on the screen. This is only appearing in my output panel as the as the designer. It's not actually um, outputting anything to the screen. That's a little bit more complex. And so the important part is that if I've hit the boss enough, something will happen. Directly, the uh, all bosses dead will become true. Variable to true. Then move the boss, the mini boss object. So if I've hit it enough, it's dead. I don't have any animation to show that it, it's defeated and so forth. That'll be icing on the cake. But if I've defeated it, get it out of the screen, it's no longer um, interactive. So We have remove child. This is the code to remove something from the screen. What we're removing is this um, boss itself. I believe we're, we need one more thing here. Stop the timeline. I think we just have a stop here. I've got to double check that one. So the timeline is happening. I have a time limit to get to. If I hit the boss enough times, stop the timeline, stop the timer, press the um, door, go to the good ending. If I wait too long, the timeline goes to frame 120, I automatically die. If um, I don't tap the boss enough times within the time limit. I never reach the time, the, the hit limit, then I also die. So finally here, we have to then set, well, what is the value I'm trying to get to? Now to make it be obvious that it's first working, that it's too hard, I'm gonna say it here, if the hall right boss is greater than or equal to 999, so you have to tap this 999 times in like four seconds. You probably will not be able to do that. So on purpose, I'm gonna make it impossible just to test it. Cause I want to test, am I, is the code work that I'm hitting the boss? Does the time limit work? I wanna test all the bad stuff first. Then in a moment to test it, I'll set it to like nine or two or something. So then if I can do that within the X amount of time, then I'll get the good ending. First, I want to continue the bad ending here. Let's check this code. So yes, it is a lot of hit points there. 99 hit points. If I hit at least 90, 999, I've defeated the boss. I get is dead set to true. If I try to tap the door, I can't get through the door yet. The boss is not defeated yet. So. Just keep an eye out on the output there. I need to look at the game here. So I'll go to start. I'll go to the door. I'll go to the front door, hit the rock. Got it. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to take to the right. First, I'm going to tap. Nothing's happening. So current hits zero at the hallway to the right. Time is running out. You didn't beat the boss in time. Bad ending. Okay. So now I'm going to... Now I'm going to this time 
start hitting the boss. This sometimes the part of this testing is a little slow. All part of it. And um, this time I'm going to here, here it comes. So when I get to the boss here. So start, go here, move that rock. Move to the right. Okay, there's the boss. I'm going to start tapping it. Tap the boss, tap the boss. Tap, tap, tap the boss. I'm tapping the boss. So you are seeing out there, I did manage 30 hits. Let's see what my output looks like here. So I was at the main hall. I went to the right. I'm at the right hallway. The hit points of the boss are zero. Um, I'm hitting the boss. I hit it once. It's not enough. Keep fighting. I'm hitting the boss. It's not enough. Keep fighting. Keep going. Keep going. I've managed to go all the way to 30. Not enough. Didn't beat the boss. Bad ending. So I couldn't get, amazingly, I couldn't get to 999 hits in three seconds. So for the testing, I'm going to make this now very easy. Oops, what's happening here? Um, I'm going to make it very easy. Five. If you hit it at least five times, it should trigger um, true, and then I should be able to go through the door. If all right bosses hits have been at least five, race should happen, hit the boss enough, and then the variable switch, switch should switch from false to true, line 35. The boss will be removed from the screen, line 37. This timeline should stop at this point, wherever it is, and then I should be able to interact with the with the door. So let's see. Start, open gate, rock, right hallway. There's the boss. Start tapping. Here we go. I tapped it enough. So on the webcam. I tapped it enough. The boss went away. No, there wasn't any fancy animation. I'd have to further program it. The boss went away on screen. Timeline stopped at that point. Uh, okay, so here it shows. I hit it one, two, three, four, five. Hit the boss enough. You've hit the boss enough. So then I'll press the door. Uh, boss is dead, go to good ending. And I'm at the good ending. Got the pot of gold. So it's doing exactly what I want. This, this, this scene with a boss to battle, this is the basics of it. Keeping track of something being true or false. Something can happen, but only if something else is true or false. We make that become true or false with more conditional statements. We keep track of hit points, attempts, steps taken, whatever. Then we check um, those values. We change the Boolean value. We remove something from on screen, no longer interactive. We stop the timeline. We move us to another screen, etc. cetera. Closer and closer. All left will be for next time. We'll have other things to happen there. And then sound, and then the game's done. Of course, there's many more things to be done, and the polish or the uh, icing on the cake of polishing up the graphics and so forth. But within the next two class meetings, we'll have everything accomplished that I want you to. And then you'll do your own version of it. So I am doing this haunted house on your storyboard, your animation, your script for your project is probably not a haunted house. Um, you probably want to change the assets and such for it to fit your idea, your project. You won't get a bad grade if you use the idea of a haunted house also, I guess. You will need to do the requirements of the homework about the various number of scenes and interactivity and the code, the code needs to work. 
So if it's all just stick figures, and this is all stick figures basically, but the visuals are gonna be secondary compared to the code. And you see how we're getting today, we got complex also with hit detection. We keep doing a few things over and over. We keep doing the, um, keep doing over and over. There's something that is interactive, run some code move us somewhere. We keep doing that over and over. We've done that several times. New things that we're adding or things that we do over and over a couple times is have a have a movie clip play so that it can then take us elsewhere. New things we started to look at are the complexity of creating um, dead end interactivity, which is just play a timeline and that's it. Don't make it do anything more. The front door and the tree are dead ends. We set up the complexity of moving objects, well, making a boundaries first, paying attention to when we start moving it, when we stop moving it. As we move it, just, you know, move it across the screen. As we stop moving it, now check, did this object interact with this object? If it didn't, do nothing. If it did, play a timeline, which takes us to the next scene. This next scene was just a simple one, go left or go right. If we go right, here now we have a time limit, number of frames playing. If we don't get to the, if we don't do what we need to do within 120 frames, we automatically go dead. Time limit, we hit the boss enough times, our variable becomes true, the boss goes away, the timeline stops, and then when I interact with the door, I go to the good ending. I can't go to the good ending until I've defeated the boss. True. The boss is defeated true by the number of hits. Get to the number of hits, we get to true, and we get to go to the good ending. So if this kind of makes sense a little bit, great. If not, you definitely need to rewatch the recording. You need to check my example code that I'm going to upload to Canvas. You need to come in for help in the lab time. You need to watch the calendar and believe me that the semester is about to end. I'm not making it up. You have, a, you have limits and such. If you haven't turned in the movie yet, you're, you're turning it in late because now you have one final less than a week. I'm counting next week. But next week when we finish the last two lectures, between Wednesday and Sunday, You've got to get it all working. I'm not trying to add stress. I'm saying that you should be, since Monday and today, and then next Monday and next Wednesday, you should be working on the game already. If you're still wasting time on the animation, you are wasting time on the animation. Sounds harsh? I need to say it harshly. Um, because then the final game is coming up and no exceptions on that deadline. So this should be pretty exciting. You've got a, a game coming together and it'll be very cool when you show people, check out my game on my device, play it. And you actually have them there playing it on your real device. And these are games that eventually they could go to the real app stores and you could be getting rich 99 cents at a time. So we'll end the lecture at this point. I'll upload the recording. I'll upload my example code and such. And we'll. Uh, Continue it all on Monday.